Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and kofifi, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on Planet Earth. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. We are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is John Schnepp. Kofi, 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 Kofi. Also here, Jeremy Johns. We had much speculation as to what a Kofi party was. Some of it was rated PG, some of it was not. <laughs> also here, Mark Ellis. We all know that Kofi is just the White House code for bath time. It's bath time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, a lot of stuff to get through today. Ashley, kick us off. Edge of Tomorrow director Doug Liman recently appeared on MTV's Happy, Sad, Confused podcast to talk his latest movie, The Wall, when the director revealed some interesting details about the Edge of Tomorrow sequel, newly entitled Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat. While reiterating that the movie is a sequel that's a prequel, Liman also revealed that the movie will be the final movie in what he describes as a two-movie franchise. Liman said... I see this as a two-movie franchise. There's the completion of the story that we set up in the first movie and the relationships between Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. Because remember, at the end of the first movie, she doesn't know who he is, and that's going to launch us into an amazing new direction. It does pick up right where we left off, but it doesn't go keep going forward because we'd screw with time because the aliens screwed with time. John, thoughts on The Edge of Tomorrow sequel being the last one in the franchise? And the Academy Award for Worst Fucking Title Ever goes to... <laughs> yeah, what a stupid title that is. But such a great movie. <laughs> that first one is so great. And I'm kind of of two minds on this. On one side, I'm thinking, you know what? The idea of that, no, it's going to be two and we're shutting the door. Good for you. Like, you've got your plan for your story. You know where you're going to shut it off. And just to come out and say it's a, it's a two-part thing and then we're done. Good for you. But on the other side of my brain, just like... Hey, you don't want to pull a Saban and go, we're making seven Power Rangers movies. Don't say the next one's the last one. Because with all your good intentions, Mr. Lyman, you put, this movie comes out and makes $185 million at the domestic box office, $200 million at the domestic box office. Guess what? You may have only planned for two, but the studio's going to have other plans. They're going to go, oh, my God. And, and, well, they should. It's a business. I get it, too. So I, I dig that they're just planning for two, but don't come out and say, that's it, then we're done, because if it does super well, you know the studio's going to want to do another one. I don't know. What do you think about this? Yeah, I call Kofifi on that name, John. <laughs> if, it, if it's going to be called Never to Die Again or Live, Die, Repeat, and Again and Again, it will be the last movie in the franchise, because it's a hard movie to sell tickets for, even if you have Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt based off the greatness of the first film. I like this news, though. This is very refreshing, that as opposed to the news stories that we get all the time where, oh, they're going to reboot Resident Evil, and it's going to be six new movies, or we have the Dark Universe coming out. We have five movies in that franchise. Here, there's a director actually saying, you know what? This is it. This is it. We literally are making a two. They're not even pushing for a trilogy, John. They always <laughs> push for trilogies in Hollywood. I like that Lyman is writing this. I like that it's smaller, that they're not taping, uh, taking the, the, the typical sequel road of trying to go bigger and bolder and cram new stuff in there. Now we get a smaller story. We get more in depth with the characters. But this third character they're introducing is very interesting to me and how they're going to factor in to the blunt Tom Cruise storyline. So reading this actually made me want to go see Edge of Tomorrow again. I've seen the movie like five times. I need to repeat it and repeat it again one more time to get me juiced for this. And by the way, guys, if any of you have still not seen the first one, treat yourself and see it. It's a mm -hmm. really fun movie. Anyway, Schnapp, what do you think about all this? Uh, <clears throat> I don't like it. Go <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't like when somebody announces the end of a franchise before you've even gotten a chance to see it. I don't right. think Edge of Tomorrow even needs a sequel. Like, I just like it as a one and done. It's great. It's like a, a cool sci-fi Groundhog Day. It, I, this serves no purpose to be like, it's a two-picture film series. Like, why are you even bragging about it? It's, it's, it ends at this one. That's the weirdest statement I could possibly imagine. Bizarre. What do you think, Jeremy? Well, well I think uh, it was meant to be one, a one-off, and then the studio's like, can you make a follow-up to that? Because the first one, the, you know, people ended up liking it, so I guess they're going to do that. Yeah, that live, die, repeat, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> I started laughing when I heard it because it reminded me of Dumb and Dumber. -er. I don't know why. It's just that's exactly the title that came to my mind. Live when die I heard repeat. -er. This. Yeah, re live yeah. die repeat. -er -er. A good day to live die repeat. -er harder. <laughs> it's just it's a strange title, but I mean I, I'm interested to see where it goes. There's a lot. I mean anything. Anytime you deal with time, you can do more stuff with it with the sequel. As long as the sequel doesn't screw up what the first one was and you look back you're like oh okay so that was kind of leading to something that wasn't so special but i mean I, i'm totally down with it the first movie was a surprise to me i'm interested to see where they go i mean tom cruise and emily blunt are coming back and it is i, I hadn't really thought of that like she doesn't know who he is when he comes back so he probably has all these tales to tell of of the of the multiple attempts at war or saving the the human race that they did so yeah i'm down for it the first one surprised me maybe the second one will please change the title <laughs> all right what's next in a report from deadline via the playlist insiders for both pirates of the caribbean 5 and baywatch are blaming rotten tomatoes for slowing down the potential business of popcorn movies the report essentially states that critics are ruining what were once thought of as critic proof movies further stating that some of their studio insiders want to hold off on critic screenings until opening day or cancel them altogether. The trade goes on to indirectly quote one insider saying that Pirates 5 and Baywatch aren't built for critics but rather general audiences and once upon a time these types of films, a family adventure and a raunchy R-rated comedy were critic proof. Mark, what do you think about Deadline's report in which insiders blame Rotten Tomatoes for poor box office? I think that the insiders are correct on a surface level that people see Rotten Tomato scores and it may e eke them away from a movie but when you get deeper, make a good movie, and you don't have to worry about the Rotten Tomato score because it's going to be good. Look at what Wonder Woman did. It's got a great Rotten Tomato score, so people are probably going to flock to that movie, whereas with a Pirates or a Baywatch, I didn't see Baywatch. I haven't heard great things. I did see Pirates, and I didn't give it a fresh review because I didn't think it was that good. So you have people, as a, as a general movie-going public, you're going to look at something easy. That's what Rotten Tomatoes does, where it's not one critic, it's an aggregate. So if you look at something that is just a score, it's a lot easier for somebody who is just deciding what movie to go to to be like, oh, well, this has that percentage, this has that percentage, as opposed to the old days where you had to go to your, your USA Today's, your Chicago Sun-Times, whatever you read, to see, oh, no, I, I want to see this movie now because of what this critic says. So... I understand why the studio is hesitant to want to do critic screenings with movies like this, and that's their decision. But I'll also tell you this, is that if you have Pirate 6 and Baywatch 2 come out and you say, we're not screening this for critics, there's going to be other summer movies that do screen for critics because they believe in their product. Like if you have a Wonder Woman sequel or you have The Mummy comes out and that gets good Rotten Tomato scores, they're not going to be shying away from critics. So it's only when you have a product that you're not sure about how it's going to be received that's when you hold back the critic screenings. That's been the way it's been for a long time. I think it's going to continue that trend, John. Regardless of what you want to say about Rotten Tomatoes, I think it's a fair aggregate of how a certain sect is feeling. And if you're not confident in your picture, then you probably shouldn't have critic screenings. Yeah, you know, this reminds me a lot. I do a lot of, if you're like me at all, I do a lot of shopping on Amazon. I buy a lot of crap off Amazon. And one of the first thing my eyes go to when I'm looking at certain products is, what do the people say about it? What is the score on it? Because if I'm looking at a new piece of computer equipment or a new piece of video gear, whatever, and it's got like one star, I'm just going to pass on it. And that is a protection system in place for we, the consumer. And look, going to the movies is an investment. Like if you're, ta heaven forbid, you're taking a date to a movie, like you're probably going to pay 40 or 50 bucks that night for you and your date to go to the movie, buy some food while you're there, all that kind of stuff. It's an investment. Consumers should have a layer in between the corporate machine, which is the corporation putting together trailers and trying to trick you into going to see their movie. And that's their job. I don't mean that in a derogatory. That is their job to trick you into going to see their movie. And the consumer, there should be that middle, there should be that middle layer there where you've got a, a group of people that do see the films and they say, hey, well, this is what we thought of it. Now you decide if you want to go see it. This whole notion, though, that it's always, Studios have put out bad movies that will try to create this illusion that film critics are somehow some different race of creatures other than human beings. No, they, look, this, take a look at this guy. This guy right here, look at that face. That is a Rotten Tomatoes critic. This is a tomato. All right, that is a Rotten Tomatoes critic. Now also, you can find a friend, uh, like a friend of ours, James Rocky, who's a Rotten Tomatoes, and he's a suit wearing different, 
the thing is, there are like 500 critics on Rotten Tomatoes, like from all, all different walks, they're all different types of people, and you're gonna get a, an aggregate score of what people are. But do you wanna make sure, you wanna solve this problem? Make a good movie. Don't tell me, well, oh, well, just the, the critics don't like uh, raunchy R-rated. Then tell me fucking why 21 Jump Street got an 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. Don't give me your bullshit excuse. Oh, they uh, uh, they just didn't like it because they don't like raunchy. No, no, there's raunchy R comedies and the critics fucking loved it. Why do you, the critics love Deadpool. Like, why do you think that? You want to make a good soup? Do what Mark was just saying. Make Wonder Woman. You want to solve your Rotten Tomatoes problem? Make a good movie so that the critics like it. Don't give me these bullshit crybaby excuses about, oh, the critics just don't, no, 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 shut your freaking mouth. Just shut up. You're just embarrassing yourself. Anyway, Jeremy. I love the fact that that started amping up as, <laughs> as you started monologuing, but I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, my mom always said, after the birth of art came the inevitable afterbirth of the art critic. And so I love the fact. Awesome. Yeah. So now, then I was like, well, I want to be after birth. I don't. I just want to do that. That sounded like a good idea. But I love the fact that it's like this new phenomenon called Rotten Tomatoes and reviews. 2017 happened and it's just one day I get the, it's it's not a new thing ever since there's been movies there have been people talking about movies as to whether or not their friends should go see it and rightfully so like you said it's just like a consumer thing like if there weren't critics at all I'd go to my friends and be like hey what did you think about that movie because you see it before me so it's there's nothing you can do about it people talk and the, the fact is just make a good movie it's like I, I mean I'll one up the uh when you were saying date night, you're going to spend 50 bucks. Like, to go on a date, you have to make someone think that you are worth taking on a date. Movies are the same way. So, like, if you want to go on a date with someone and someone knows that person has herpes, you want your friend to tell you that if that's the way it is. <laughs> Movies are the same way. Hey, so, you didn't say that in the trailer that you had something going on down there. Right, <laughs> exactly. You want people to be honest. You just want to know what you're in for, you know? So it's just, it's a weird thing that they're like, this is all just a very new phenomenon. It's not. It's not brand new. It's been happening for decades. So Jeremy just Johns, hashtag you. You just want to know what you're in for. Right. Uh, <laughs> snap. All this talk of wet proteins makes me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Kofifi, I don't know. Uh, look, you know, it's a, it's a sad state of affairs when large studios start doing what a lot of crybaby people were doing last year about Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes, like we've discussed many times, is an amalgamation of a bunch of different critic scores. I mean, used to go to Roger Ebert, Siskel and Ebert, thumbs up, thumbs down if you really cared about it. Otherwise, you would just go see the movies like, ah, screw it. That's exactly what people do nowadays with a Rotten Tomatoes score. It's like, oh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 77, but I really want to see that movie. I'm going to see it and make up my own mind. You might not go see it if a Rotten Tomatoes score is like at 17. You might be like, woohoo, I'm avoiding it. Even if you thought about it, you were like, I will wait for a video. So yes, I think Rotten Tomatoes definitely has some kind of effect on all of the movies as it should because i think it's great it's it's an amalgamation it's a it's a way to look at a, a generalized score it's, instead of just going to siskel or ebert or scrimpy or scrompy you're going to like a group of people and then they average it out and that would be the average film going audience then it's like the the overall average so if you're somebody who loves science fiction and this science fiction film got a 63 you might actually give it an 85 because you love science fiction you'd be more forgiving of some of the tropes that other people didn't get or went over their head. So, you know, look, when I see that studios are, are complaining about movies like Baywatch and Pirates of the Caribbean 4 that it underperformed, I think it's five people, uh, five, sorry, that is people are just tired of it. Maybe I, that's it. You know what's surprising me too is that it, it, there are still, I still see this on Twitter and on my Facebook and, and the comments all the time. There's still people out there who think that Rotten Tomatoes is this body that Rotten Tomatoes gives a movie a score. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't give scores no. to anything. They, they don't do that. They go out to all the, all the critics, television, newspaper, online, radio, whatever, and then they just average up what the score is. And it's, I, I, I love the argument I get with some people with Metacritic. Like some people, like I prefer, and Metacritic's great. I love Metacritic. But some people say, well, Metacritic's better than Rotten Tomatoes. Or Rotten Tomatoes is better than Metacritic. You do know they all use the same critics, right? Like they all, they all draw from the same critics. And so it's not a big thing. But here's what's going to happen. Here's what would happen. If studios, and I don't think they'll ever do this because I believe the studios are smarter than this, but if the studios were ever dumb enough to say, we're not going to allow the market to have that middle layer between the corporate machine and the consumer, we're gonna have no press screenings for people. What will eventually happen is that the market itself will self-correct. And what will eventually happen is that a studio like Warner Brothers or a studio like Disney or whatever will go, oh, you know what? 
we've got this movie and we know people are going to love it. And it would really help our marketing if we did show this to critics two weeks early so they can start talking about it. And then all the other studios will start doing it. And then the whole, the, then the market will know, hey, that studio isn't letting critics see that movie. That means they know their movie's bad and we just won't go see it. So you can try it, but it's only going to last for about two years and then the market will self-correct. So I don't even really see the point of this. You, you take that Wonder Woman argument where a couple of weeks ago everybody was complaining, and I think in some cases rightfully so, that this movie was not being marketed heavily enough. And then you talk about how genius they are this week for what, what a great marketing campaign Wonder Woman's had. It's because the movie's good. It's because they pushed back the embargo so now we can talk about the movie earlier because we like the movie. So you do something where if you get, you're allowed to have social media responses, which you were allowed to have with Wonder Woman a couple weeks ago, but you weren't allowed to review the film in whole, and then the embargo comes out and it's like, oh good, now these reviews are coming in and they're mostly positive. That's fair to do, but I agree with what John said. It's like if you have a Fantastic Four on your hands, you're going to want to hide that from critics, but eventually movies are going to break through and they're going to say, no, we should have this come out earlier for critics because we believe in our product. And I love Jeremy's idea about having trailers for who you're going out on a date with. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. By the way, where are all those crybaby conspiracy theorists who are like, movie critics have an anti-DC bias. <laughs> uh, Wonder Woman's got a 96% right now. Right. Crickets. All right. What's... <gasps> Yeah, no, no, it's it's not uh, it's not a good look uh, whatsoever. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? The first trailer for Paddington 2 has been released online. The sequel picks up with Paddington Bear, voiced by Ben Wishaw, settled in his life with the Brown family at Windsor Gardens. When Paddington sees a unique pop-up book in an antique shop, he decides it'll be the perfect present for Aunt Lucy's 130, 100th birthday and starts doing odd jobs to save up. The film also stars Hugh Grant, Brendan Gleeson, Hugh Bonneville, Jim Broadbent, Peter Capaldi, and Imelda Staunton. Paddington 2 opens in theaters on January 12, 2018. Schnett buyer saw the first trailer for Paddington 2. Well, I'm going to buy it based off of the first movie, Paddington, because the Paddington, for the first movie, for the trailers for the first film, I absolutely hated. And I was like, I don't want to see this movie. It looks stupid. It looks goofy. I saw the movie, and I absolutely loved it. I'm not a big fan of this trailer, but I feel like it's got the same kind of thing that's happening with the first trailer where they're like showing all this goofy, stupid stuff and a, a bucket hits the bear and it's like, hoo hoo, play, do, do. <laughs> so hopefully it's got the same flavor and vibe from the first Paddington and it's just got a dumb trailer. So I'm going to reluctantly buy this stupid trailer. Jeremy. Yeah, I'm going <clears> to <throat> buy the trailer and admit something horrible. I've never seen Paddington. Oh, <laughs> everyone I know. Gosh. Everybody I know, online and off, is like, that was one of my favorite movies that year. Is it the Rotten so, Tomato score keeping you away? <laughs> the yeah. Rotten Tomato yeah. does it have a good or bad score. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've got a great yeah, score. Now, i, I got to look it now up. I'm, now I'm really curious. But, I mean, I, I agree with Schnepp. If this was the first introduction to Paddington, anything I ever had, it'd be like, all right, so this is another kid's movie coming out. And I, guess, I mean, is it Captain Underpants or Paddington? What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> no one knows. But uh, because of everything I've heard about the first Paddington, I it then I'm like, oh, now I need to see Paddington 1 before I see Paddington 2. So, I mean, not a, not, it's not a trailer that grabs me, but the chatter about the first Paddington grabs me. What's it got? Okay, so take, get, what's the Rotten Tomato score? Of Pad Which, by the way, I complete. Schnepp and I were on the same boat. We were both like, this, I don't know, this movie could be iffy. And then we both came out. I was like, I love that I bear. Know, I love yeah. the bear. <laughs> yeah. what, what do you think of Rotten Tomato scores? Uh, 72? 90. 85. Ashley, what do you think? Oh, my God. I was going to say I was uh, high 80s, low 90s. Wendy? This is for Paddington? Yes. The first one. 79. All right. None of you were close. It's 98. <gasps> Damn! Oh, yeah. wow. And it's, it's totally deserves It's a completely... Yeah. I, I, <laughs> um, I think everybody I know with all the massive different tastes in movies, every, I think everybody I know would like that movie. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's something in for everybody. I don't, okay, anyway, sorry. Back on track. Sorry, Mark. That bear is what think about this so trailer? charming, John. I, and, and look, I was in Big Bear this weekend. I went to a zoo and I saw some real live bears up close. I don't care if you're the tiniest bear in the world. You can pick up a bucket full of soap, okay? There's no struggle there whatsoever. Bears are cute, but they're vicious creatures and they can pick up, like an Ewok. An Ewok could easily pick up. Even Wicket could do when 
window's no problem. Mm. That bear is just so cute. I can't handle it. I thought the bucket thing was funny at the end. And there's another visual gag in there that I thought worked really well when they're breaking into a house and a vase falls. It just, it worked. And a lot of that is the glaze that I have from the first movie where I enjoyed it so much like you guys. I walked into that movie like, okay, let's do this kid's movie. And I walked out loving that bear. He is so cute. Just be careful if you try to hug him because he will eat your face. <laughs> All right, what's next? Lionsgate has unveiled a new Red Band trailer for the action comedy The Hitman's Bodyguard, starring Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson. The film sees Reynolds as the world's top protection agent, a man who is tasked with serving as the bodyguard for his mortal enemy, a notorious assassin played by Jackson. Expendables 3 Helmer, Patrick Hughes, directs the movie that also stars Gary Oldman and Selma Hayek. It opens in theaters on August 18th. Jeremy, buy or sell the new Red Band trailer for The Hitman's Bodyguard. Well, I'm going to get the po the possible negative out of the way. And I think if there's a negative, it's going to be people like, Ryan Reynolds plays the same thing every time, probably, but he's really good at it. And I feel like I've seen this premise before. That being said, it's a really entertaining trailer. I mean, it was it was funny. It made me chuckle. It has a great cast. You look at the cast, you're like, whoa, that person's in there? Well, Gary Oldman's in there? It's all lining up to be good. But that's it. If I, if I had a nickel for every time I saw a really cool, fun-looking action movie trailer that looked good where the movie sucked, it'd have a bucket full of nickels, which I actually do keep <laughs> my change like that, so it all makes sense. But I'll buy this trailer for sure. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm going to buy it. This, this sounded to me at first like it was going to be one of these throwaway films. Ah, uh, Samuel and, and uh, Ryan Reynolds have got like, still some movies hanging on their contracts. Let's get this thing done. And I... Uh, I love the trailer. I thought it was fun, and it looks like it's going to be exciting and entertaining. And if, if and that's the big if, if they can carry on that tone throughout an entire, you know, 95, 100-minute movie, I think it's going to be something really worth seeing. But we're just talking about the trailer. For me, the trailer worked. For me, it's a buy. It's a surprise buy for me as well, because the first trailer for The Hitman's Bodyguard, I was like, ah, this just looks like a throwaway at the end of the summer kind of movie. This made me laugh, man. This was fun. The action looks cool. Ryan Reynolds looks hilarious. Samuel L. Jackson looks very funny. Them complimenting each other very well. I like the cast. I like the premise. It still could be that fun throwaway action movie at the end of the summer, but sometimes I really end up enjoying those. You get a bucket of corn, you go see The Hitman's Bodyguard, could be a winner. Yeah, it's a shocking buy for myself as well. I, I had that that vibe that I'm like, wow, if they can have this throughout the entire movie, this tone, uh, like a little bit like a midnight run, you know what I mean? It had this back and forth where it's, you know, a buddy film, but they both hate each other, but they're forced to work together. It could be great. So, I mean, that's what I saw on the trailer, so I'm going to buy it. This is everything you see with me and Jeremy when Pi gets involved on Awesome Tag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? THR is reporting that Blair Witch director Adam Wingard has closed a deal to helm Godzilla vs. Kong for Legendary Entertainment and Warner Brothers Pictures. The director made a name for himself with low-budget horror thrillers such as Your Next and The Guest and will next release his adaptation of Death Note for Netflix later this summer. In March, Legendary said a writer's room to work on the script for Godzilla vs. Kong with Tara Rossio, the veteran scribe best known for co-writing the Pirates of the Caribbean movies as its head. Plot details are under wraps with a release date set for May 22nd, 2020. John Byersell, Adam Wingard directing Godzilla vs. Kong. I'm a little iffy. I see some pros and cons, but to me, the pros are going to outweigh the cons here. I like the idea of going and getting a guy who's done these smaller level kind of scrappy films. I really did like the, the most recent Blair Witch movie. I like what they did with it, uh, especially coming off what is, you know, a really classic original with some very questionable sequels mm -hmm. that came after it. So, yeah, this could be a fresh direction for it. I'll, I'm going to give it a buy. Yeah, I'm going to give it a buy as well. Wingard is a guy who, like you said, he comes from that, you know, smaller film uh, pool, if you will. But I was so happy with the new Blair Witch movie. That's generally the reason why I'm going to buy this is because I think that that built up suspense so well. And you didn't need to see the witch in order to achieve that. So when you give this guy two of the greatest movie monsters of all time, is he going to show us everything about all these creatures in the first 10 minutes? Like, would, what would be the temptation? Or is he going to be able to hold his cards a little bit closer to his vest? Now, particularly me, I enjoyed that Garrett Edwards did that with Godzilla. That you didn't see a lot of Godzilla until that huge payoff at the end. A lot of people I know were not happy with that style of filmmaking. So I thought what Jordan Vogt Roberts did with Kong was, was awesome, too. But we saw a whole lot of Kong, in my opinion. And I know some people that thought we didn't see enough Kong. So as long as we don't get overloaded with the monsters and they're utilized correctly, look, I want to see a lot of monsters in this. Don't get me wrong. I want to see a lot of fighting in this. But I also want to see it build up to some cool heavyweight fights as opposed to just have two animals fighting for two hours. That 
it, from a storytelling perspective, I think Wingard is going to excel at. So that's why I'm buying it. What do you think, Schnapp? I, I love this. Uh, I've gotten a chance to work with Adam. He's an incredible guy, and I know yeah, you him. guys both worked on ABC's of yeah, Death, right? Yes, we have. And uh, uh, he's a great guy, and I've uh, gotten a chance to talk with him just about film and horror. And he is a perfect director for uh, it, it would seem like it's coming out of left field, but when you know him and his interests, I mean, this has got Kong, it's got Godzilla, it's got Ghidra, it's got Rodan, it's got all these monsters, and this is like. This guy is perfect for the role, so I'm so happy to hear. Like, it came out of nowhere. Like, Adam Wingard's going to do this. I was like, it's perfect. I mean, so for me, I cannot wait to see what he does with this. Yeah, I'm in the boat of uh, people who haven't met or worked with the guy. So at first, I was like, whoa, he's done a lot of smaller stuff, which has worked out in the past, where someone proves their salt with the smaller films, and they get a big film, and they totally crush it on there. But it's, it's good to hear you're like, no, 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 I know the guy's mind. I've talked. I've exchanged words with him, and it, it totally works. I feel like, Mark, if, if we can sum it up, you don't want it. You don't want to be transformed on this one. So you know, yeah. that, I mean, look, I want to see all these monsters. I want to see them in a lot of the movie, but I also want there to be some semblance yeah. of a story that Intrigue. builds towards this right. exciting conclusion. Yeah, that's a, and that's when you're dealing with big things that are very extraordinary. It's it's you go one of two routes. You're either it's difficult to build the intrigue. I get that, or you just have them fight and scrap, and that'll be that. So I'm hoping for the the road Mark has, where you have a lot of intrigue with them. You have uh, some character moments with the uh, the people trying to. Deal with what's going on out there, but really keep the monsters centralized and focused. Even when they're not on screen, you feel their presence in the world. So uh, for me, yeah, I buy it for sure. You know, John, you say things on this show, and you don't know if people are going to validate it or not. <laughs> and I just put myself out there, and to have this man right over here be my Rotten Tomatoes. You know what? And give my comments a fresh rating. <laughs> oh my That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you out, Mark. Now, I Patty love you so much. <laughs> Over or under 97% for Paddington on uh. Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I want to remind you that Movie oh. Talk is not the only show here on Collider Video. Just yesterday, a brand new episode of John Schnepp and his crew of Heroes dropped. You can go and find that online right now. Also, a brand new episode of the movie trivia showdown. We had the Night Sisters versus Team Deep Cuts. You're going to want to go check that out. That one was a fun, a fun game, actually. Also, our review for Wonder Woman is now up. You can check that out. And a little bit later this week, when as soon as the film opens, we're going to have our spoiler review for Wonder Woman as well. You're going to want to see that. And, of course, every Friday, Jeremy Johns and his show, Awesome Tacular. New episodes every Friday on the Verizon Go 90 He's Network. He's the app right now. Look at him. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> We're going to get to some Twitter questions here in a bit, but first we're going to go to our mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show Monday through Friday or on our mailbag show on the weekends, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? Xander writes, hello, Collider crew. My question is about the future of the Alien Prometheus franchise. After looking through the box office for Alien Covenant, its second week dropped with a 71%. Yikes. My question is, do you think 20th Century Fox and Ridley Scott will now want to talk and listen to Neil Blomkamp's dream project idea for Alien 5 in order to save the franchise. Thanks and keep the show rolling. Um, no. I, I don't think, you know, first of all, you cannot under, understate this. A 71% drop from week one to week two. That is... Fifty Shades of Grey numbers, mm -hmm. and I remember there was a it was a big stink made about that when for the first Fifty Shades of Grey made a seventy percent drop from week one to week two. <clears throat> Can't under you know underplay that here. That's a terrible drop. Yes, I understand Pirates of the Caribbean opened, but a seventy percent drop. If your film makes like 180, 190, 200 million opening weekend, and you think, well, that just means everybody went to go see it first weekend, and you take a 70% drop, maybe you can suck that up a little bit, but that wasn't the case. And you know, the funny thing is, Alien Covenant's a good movie. So, considering it was a good movie, um, no, I don't think going now to Neil Blomkamp is, is what they're thinking at all, because Ridley Scott made a good movie. So it's not like you know they're, they're gonna go off and have Blomkamp make a better movie than Ridley yeah. Scott did. Uh, if anything, it's going to be the reverse. So I, I don't see it working that way at all. I don't know, Stump. What do you think? Yeah, I don't. I, Neil Blomkamp is actually doing his own thing right now. You can go online and check out. He's got a short trailer. It's called the Oats Project, which is a bunch bunch of short experimental science fiction films Ooh, where he's returning. Which he exceeds at. He's, it, when, when you see this, I'm not joking. Just Oats Project, or maybe it's Oats something. Neil Blomkamp. Just look it up. Um, I just watched it this morning. I'm a fan, I'll subscribe, I'll buy the short films, whatever it is. 
He's going to be doing it through the Steam service. Check it out. He's got his own thing going on. He doesn't need this Aliens 5 or whatever. And that's, that's not going to happen. What they are going to do is they are going to make another Ridley Scott film, continuing his version of Aliens because it's the long haul. So the movie didn't make that much money at the box office. It's going to kill it on home, you know, on video and on, on streaming. People are going to buy it. And then when the whole, the next, a, a, I think, Alien quadrilogy comes out where it'll be Alien and then these four Ridley Scott movies that he's making, that's an entire other brand new franchise that will live on forever. So I think they're going to let Ridley Scott finish at least his idea for connecting it to the original Alien. Otherwise, it'd be kind of stupid, I think. Jeremy? I do want to hold out. I want the studio to at least have enough faith to be like, maybe we'll cut the budget back a little bit, mm -hmm. but I really do want to see what he has. And, I mean, like our second story on the, uh, on the sidebar here said, it was like, I guess you could chalk it up to like, well, Pirates came out. That's why it dropped. But uh, no one went to see Pirates. That's what we were talking about <laughs> on the show. Right. So you can't really blame Pirates at all. It's just the movie didn't make enough. But I, I want to see what it does overseas, and I hope the studio does let him finish his story. But between Pirates and Baywatch, you, you had $100 million that, that a movie going public could have spent, which is why I think that as much as I love the marketing material for Alien Covenant, in the, in the heat of the summer may not have been the right time to open a movie like this. And mm -hmm. I, it's the same argument yeah. I used for the last Star Trek movie, is that it critically it did well, people were excited, it was the best of the new Star Trek, is what I heard from a lot of people, but maybe don't open that in the middle of the summer. And I'm not sure that they will allow Ridley Scott to continue making Alien movies, because this one didn't cost that much money to make. I think it was its budget was around the $100 million mark, even a little bit less, so... If it's an alien movie, you should be able to recoup that expense, whether it's domestic or overseas. And it's not going to do that by a whole lot. So if they cut the budget drastically, then I like that we can continue on this world. But if I'm Ridley Scott, the last person I want to talk to right now is Neil Blomkamp. Not because he's not talented. I love what he's done with his first two movies. However, if you had a movie come out and you're happy with it and critics seem to be happy with it and the audiences that saw it seem to be happy with it, it just didn't make that much money at the box office, the last person you want to talk to is a studio saying, oh, we got to bring this other guy in to give you a help. It's like, no, I, I don't, I can win championships on my own. I don't need this other guy coming in with his ideas. I have a vision where I want to take this. So hopefully he gets to realize that. All right, guys. Well, I said we'd save a little bit of time to take some Twitter questions. We're going to do that right now. Hey, listen, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Fire in some questions whenever you'd like. Wendy, what questions have you picked out today? The first one comes from Evren, who writes, what is your favorite parody slash spoof movie, and why hasn't there been a good one in recent years? Mine is Scary Movie, the first one. Thanks. Okay, there, oh. I love the, this. I mean, <laughs> like, you got a couple of classics, and I'm torn, I'm usually torn between three. One being Hot Shots Part Two, yep. which I really love. Mm -hmm. Are you going to take three from us? In, uh, okay, I'll just say one then. <laughs> I'll just say one. Uh, and I will go with um, uh, the Val Kilmer... Top so, secret. Top, yes. se top secret. That movie, you watch that movie and you go to bed. Latrine. I. Not that I, I'm. Not that I'm there with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, little John Kofifi. No, okay, no, you're, you're <laughs> a different movie. You're a different movie. Um, that one to me is just so ripping, hilarious, and there was just an era. It felt like where really well done spoof movies were great, and then you got into this era with whoever those filmmakers are that made like movie, stop or my Spartans will be right. 50 yards from the Ooh, block or whatever yeah. like <laughs> where it's just like make them shit and piss a lot and do a lot of dick jokes it's like they spoof movies used to be really smart uh, and, and like like the original airplane like great social commentary as well but anyway I'm gonna go with with um, uh, what did I just say? Top Secret Top and Hot secret. Shots Part Two. Jeremy's chomping at the bit right now. Yeah, I am. I Let am. it out. Because I got it. All right, I'm going to give credit for Lego Batman for being a good modern spoof. Because, mm. again, I thought they were dead. I love the fact that you threw out a stop or my mom will shoot title <laughs> yeah. spoof. I just love that. But Spaceballs has got to be the best oh for me. Oh, my God, yeah. The that's so Spaceballs. Great. Yes. Is, I, I, I remember seeing it when I was a kid. The babysitter was like, here, watch this. I was like, okay. <laughs> and, I, I mean, huh. greatest babysitter ever. It changed my world. I loved Mel Brooks after that I, I just I love spoof movies after that and very few have ever come close we ain't found shit yes <laughs> baseball so is one of the best spoof movies of all time however I will give props to I think that that Blazing Saddles and more importantly so for good. me anyway Young Frankenstein really kicked <laughs> off the modern spoof as we know it today now Monty Python and those guys were doing great work and I think that the Holy Grail is the funniest movie ever made 
bar none. As far as just a straight spoof flick goes, you, you can't get better than Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I will give a shout out to the Naked Gun movies where they get tougher to watch now because there's a guy that might have had a double murder in there. But <laughs> it's a very funny movie. At least the first two and a half movies are great. I'm going to say the first Hot Shots is another spoof movie that everybody should watch because, and I, this is not hyperbole, okay? Lloyd Bridges, as Admiral Benson in the first Hot Shots movie, is one of the great comedy performances I have ever seen in my entire life. The man literally does not miss a line. He gets everything out of every piece of material he has. It is fall down funny to this day. And Schnapp, I don't know why spoof movies aren't as good as they used to be. Part of the reason could be that I'm an adult. And that when I watch these now, I'm just going in with a different set of jaded eyes. I don't like to think that about myself, but it's a raging debate I have in my head quite often. Okay, the don't, first problem yeah. was the whole, you're an adult thing. But the second yeah. thing, you what? know, I think a lot of people still don't realize today, Lloyd Bridges, he uh, he sired a couple of uh, very talented yeah, that's right. young Jeff dudes. Bridges. Jeff Bridges and, oh, what's his brother's Bo. name? Uh, Bo. And Bo Bridges. Like, and, and yeah, it's the same guy, same family. That's where mm -hmm. he came from. The guy from Airplane. Um, yeah. You know what? Don't blame yourself for being an adult because... My parents took me to go see Blazing Saddles and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> and they were just as old as us and laughing their ass off. Yes. So it's, it really is the de destruction of our normal society. <laughs> downward spiral into death and destruction. Put the candle back. <laughs> Young Frankenstein is my favorite spoof movie of all time. Actually, I think two of my... I, I, I've, got a, I've got a list of like my top ten favorite single funniest moments... And not necessarily funnest movies, moments. The top of the list to me, I've never seen a movie, a moment in any movie that made me literally laugh myself sick to the point that I had I had problems breathing. As and I can't do it just you just have to watch in context. As when Dark Helmet says, Now Lone Star, you'll see the evil will always triumph because good is dumb. Very close mm -hmm. on its heels, mm -hmm. blazing saddles, where are the white women at? That that line also made me just about fall yeah. over and die. There, there's there, there's twenty of them in Top Secret that just are, that, that yeah. literally <laughs> floor me. Whether driver, this isn't the Howard Johnsons or what phony dog poo. Or I know a little German. He's sitting over there. It's just that movie is. Just, it, and a lot of people like you've heard of Airplane and Naked Gun. If you have not heard of Top Secret, go get yeah. it. Right, you can get it on DVD for like five bucks. It is. It's worth a lifetime of laughs. I promise you. All right, let's, what's next, Wendy? This one comes from Rocky Drago 66, who writes, Emily Blunt and Scarlett Johansson have both never been nominated for Oscars, so who do you think will get theirs first? Ooh. Ooh. Good battle there. And they are both Academy-level yep. actresses. That's, uh, Let me flip a coin. Well, I mean, it all depends. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to actually sit down and look, what's their upcoming filmography, and which one looks like the type of movie and the type of role that could nab them that... It's a, it's a fabulous question. I mm. honestly have no answer for it. You know what's weird is that you have one of those thinking machines in front of you. You can, you can check out their upcoming movies. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, but I had this talk. I think <laughs> It's called a Turing <laughs> yeah. machine, Ellis. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. T-U-R-I-N-G. Like, I, I would have said, it, before The Girl on the Train came out, I would yeah. have said that, no, Emily Blunt is going to get nominated for this. Mm -hmm. But Scarlett Johansson has done a number of movies where I'm like, yeah, she's, she's right there in the cusp. I thought Scarlett Johansson could have been nominated for her voice work in her. Like, she was that good in that movie. A lot of people thought she would. So I, I, I just think because... So Emily Blunt's got the Edge of Tomorrow movie coming out, which we know. Yeah. So I don't think that's going to get in. I, that's not an Oscar kind of movie. Bless so I'm going to give the slight edge to Scarlett Johansson, but it is, uh, it's tough. Scarlett Johansson has that Up All Night movie coming out, so that's not yeah, looking that's good. Yeah, that's not going to win any Oscar. Oscars. And then the next Avengers, and I don't think she's going to win an yeah. Oscar for you Avengers. You guys are such critics. <laughs> <laughs> the real people out there know that now, Scarlett Johansson. Wait a minute, I, I think I may have found her answer, okay? Because in 2017, a little bit later this year, Emily Blunt's got a little movie called My Little Pony, the movie. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> where she does the voice of Tempest Shadow. Game changer. If that doesn't scream. Oscar uh, winner. I think she's got Mary Poppins. My Little Ooh. Pony has a huge following. But yeah. Hey, guys, um, oh, friendship is magic, okay? Yeah. Friendship is magic. Yeah. Friendship <laughs> is magic. <laughs> and right. Ronies are real. Oh, yeah. Nice. When I heard that she would, because I was like, eh, yeah, what, Mary Poppins movie. I don't need a Mary Poppins. And then Emily Blunt was Mary Poppins. I was like, okay, I'm cool. Okay, like, one of, cool I got to share this little story quick. I might have told this before. So Dennis and I, this is back in the days 
when we were still at AMC and and our studio was this makeshift storage closet that we turned into a studio over there. And one day Dennis and I are there and in comes, it wasn't even the actor who plays Q. Delan uh, oh, gosh. Desmond uh, no, Lewin? Delance, uh, something Delance? Yes. Oh, Hugh Dancy? The new no, one or the no, old no. one? Yeah. Uh, the, the old one was Desmond Llewellyn. Quickly use the supercomputer. Q. Who? Star Trek. Somebody somebody looked that up yeah. for me. Somebody, anyway. He was, all, yeah, um, he was also Jane's dad on Breaking Bad. Was he? Yeah. I didn't realize yeah. that. Anyway, who the hell um, are you guys? Q from the James Bond movies? No, 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 no Q, Q from, from Star, Star Trek. Trek. The next generation. Q. The only Q that exists, Mark Ellis. My God. Dude, the only Q that exists is the James Bond movies. All right. You, got, you, got, a thousand, you got a thousand guys that can fix that enterprise. You John Delancey. John Delancey. Thank you. And so John Delancey comes in, and he had just <laughs> finished. There's a there's a uh, documentary out there right now on bronies, which are if you don't know what a brony is, uh, bronies are grown men who are really into My Little Pony. And they collect, and they have a name for themselves called Bronies. And John Delancey comes in, and we are just talking about what he's been working on. He's like, well, I just uh, this, this documentary. He's the narrator. So he's, he's like... a great voice. He he's does a have a great narrator him. voice. Um, so he comes in, he starts playing, he goes, they're real. And they're very interesting. And so that was the big thing. <laughs> awesome. I think if they're you're, real if, and if, if you're a grown man and like the worst thing somebody can say about you is that you enjoy collecting these horses that are like they're they're they're, they're championing friendship and togetherness. I think that's just fine when you have a lot of people and some people I know may be at this desk when you open up action hero toys and it's like, dude, I'm going to look at this thing for an hour. So I'm cool with bronies. That's totally fine. All right, let's take the last question of the day. Okay, this one comes from Lou Lawson, who writes, over or under, a 60% drop at the box office for Wonder Woman in its second week, being that The Mummy will be released that week. I don't think so. Well, okay, I, I will say mm. it's possible, but only because of this. Because, remember, they, remember a few weeks ago they said that the tracking number for Wonder Woman was going to be 65. And I said BS. It is going to, I think it's going to crush that. I think minimum it's going to make is 80. Now, if it gets into the hundred million dollar range, then we get into that territory of, okay, so now a hell of a lot of people already go out to see it week one, and you've got the mummy opening up the second week. But here's the thing, I also think the critic scores, and I think the word of mouth is gonna be really positive. I'm gonna say, what, what she set the line at over under? Um, 60. 60% that it will drop 60%? Um, under. I, I'm going to take the under on that. I think it'll probably be more in the 49 to 51 percent range. What do you think, Schnapp? Yeah, I don't think it's going to drop that extensively. Yeah, I would go with 30 or 40 percent because I think the word of mouth, like all the, just seeing the screening last night, everybody, most everybody who came out had a, like a smile on their face. Everyone was like, "Wow, that was really good." Like everybody's kind of like breaking into little groups and like talking about how much fun they had watching the film. Now, just magnify that times hundreds of thousands of people in theaters all across America, that's what's going to happen. And then all the people who didn't go see it on Friday and Saturday yeah. and Sunday have to wait that whole work week. And guess what they're going to go see before they see The Mummy? They're probably going to see Wonder Woman. If they don't see that Friday or Thursday night, they're going to see The Mummy on Saturday. So I, th I think The Mummy's going to make a lot of money. I, I don't think it's going to be a, 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 like a flop or anything like that, but I think it's got some heavy competition with Wonder Woman. You, know, you brought up an interesting point because I think even though there's a lot of good critics right now, I think there's still a bunch of people out there that are very cautious when it mm -hmm. comes to, to Wonder Woman, and maybe once they hear all the response from everybody coming out of week one, they'll flood back yep. out and go see it week two. What do you yep, think? that's exactly my thoughts, is that week one's going to be the, the diehards who want to see it, everyone at home's going to be their friends who are a little apprehensive, and then those people who came out of the movie are going to like the movie, tell their friends they like the movie, and then their, their friends are then going to be like, I need to see what all the fuss is about, so I don't think it's going to drop 60%, not against The Mummy. I actually don't know that The Mummy's going to do all that well, we'll see. I am rooting for the mummy because I Me like too. when you just step back and 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 you say okay look look they're trying to set up this whole universe and it's like we get annoyed when it's like no we got five movies in here let's just take a step back this is the mummy and they're building a cool monster universe and Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe and Sophia Patel are in this movie and it looks the, the, the trailers make me want to see this movie so I'm rooting for the mummy I will also say this I think that the mummy is a lot more concerned about Wonder Woman than Wonder Woman is concerned about the mummy yes the wonder woman is one of those rare movies that you go see it once and it has such replay value that all of us who have now seen it want to go see the movie 
again. And I think it's going to happen to a lot of people is that you want to go see it again. You want to take your friends to see it who haven't seen it. You want to take your parents, your kids to go see this movie. The Mummy, I hope, has that kind of name brand value. But let's say Wonder Woman does $110 million opening weekend, which is what I think it's going to do. So a 60% drop would put it around that $45, $50 million range second weekend. That's the high bar, I think, for The Mummy. Now, The Mummy could beat that with good reviews, but I think that Wonder Woman drops just less than 60%. I'd say it's about a 50, 52% drop. What if it's number one on the second weekend? It's going to say, who's your mummy? Totally could be. (laughs) No, who's your mummy? (laughs) They just, they got a whole new marketing campaign now for this movie. (laughs) Who's your mummy? All right. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us here on Movie Talk. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Just at John Schnepp. Support my weirdo book. Go to Kickstarter. Isolated mutations of the assembly line, baby. Come on. Sitting right beside me, Jeremy Johns. You can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. You can find my show Awesome Tacular on Go90, where I talk comic books and comic book movies with Schnepp. And then I play some games with Ellis and take some pies to the face. And if we're not taking pies to the face, we're, we're doing other stuff. But pies to the face do happen, folks. Now you're intrigued. Sitting over here, Mark Ellis. We have a running bet with the pie game that neither one of us is ever going to achieve. Right, never. Uh, speaking of assembly line babies, they usually turn out to be comedians. You can see me with a bunch of other ones this Friday and Saturday at the Comedy Store. I have two sets each night. And tonight, the Schmoes No Live show, 7 p.m. Over there, we got Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And right beside her, Wendy Lee. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campy. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.